All right, we are live. Welcome, Facebook. Glad you're here with us. My, I'm Mike Davis. I am the pastor of the Oasis in Chino, California. Sorry we are late. We were talking and fellowshipping and sharing truths from God's word and wisdom with each other in our fellowship. So it was, it was actually a good time. You have to join us sometime. All right, let's pray, and we're going to get into our study for the day. Father, we thank you so much again for your Holy Spirit. We pray as David prayed, open, Lord, that you would open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your Torah, show us your ways, teach us your paths, lead and guide us into your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. We look to you, we trust in you, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Open your Bibles, please, to uh, Isaiah chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 3. We are still in our series on who's the boss, women and men, and in biblical and cultural context. This is actually uh, lesson number 20. And we've been talking about Deborah versus the patriarchal principle or Deborah versus the patriarchal dogma. And I'll explain that in just a moment. And we are on this, on this series now, or the subsection of the series called the Deborah Dilemma. And today we're going to be talking about the Deborah Dilemma and Isaiah chapter three, verse 12 through 26, a closer look. Now, why am I calling it that? Well, in our last study, we looked at the fact, and in the last few studies, we looked at the leadership of Deborah, and we started looking at last week some of the pushback that Deborah has received as a leader of Israel. Deborah's leadership over Israel is often in complementarian circles that don't believe that women should be in positions of leadership over men. Her leadership sometimes gets, and it's often it is doubted, it is downplayed, it is diluted, and it is denied. You like those alliterations, all those Ds, okay? Her leadership is often doubted, downplayed, diluted, and denied because her leadership presents a dilemma to what I call the patriarchal principle or the patriarchal dogma of complementarianism. What is the principle? The principle is this, that men are created by God to lead and to rule, that this was done at creation, Genesis 1 and 2. Men are created to rule. Men are created to lead. Women are created, according to this principle and this concept. They are created to serve, or excuse me, they are created to submit to this leadership. They are created to follow the leadership of men and or their husbands, or I should say they are created to follow the leadership of their husbands and or men, like in the church, but that men are supposed to lead, women are supposed to submit to and follow that lead, and women are never to exercise leadership over men. So I call this the, the patriarchal principle of the patriarchal dogma. Dogma is an incontrover incontrovertible truth that people hold to or principle. So this is an incontrovertible principle. It is believed that this was established by God at creation, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. is how complementarians read that. And so when we go to Deborah in Judges chapter 4, it presents a problem um, because we see Deborah leading. So in order to explain this, as I've said, her leadership gets downplayed. Her leadership gets diluted. Or in some cases, it is outright denied that she is actually not a leader at all. Now, one of the ways that her leadership gets, gets downplayed, diluted, and denied, and by the way, when it gets downplayed, diluted, and denied, that brings doubt about Deborah's leadership. But one of the ways this is done is by putting forth the idea that a woman leader over Israel, and by extension, that would be a, a, a woman in, in authority over men, This that if you got women who are in leadership, excuse me for a second, I'm, just remember, I was supposed to have to start my clock, so I would keep on time, that if you got women who are in leadership um, over Israel, this means that they've got leadership over men like Deborah. This means that something is wrong. This means that Israel or the nation who has women in leadership over them is experiencing divine judgment. And that women in leadership over men, women in leadership in a church over men, women in, if you've got a woman in leadership, uh, in her, if, if, if she is not submitted to the leadership of her husband in the way that complementarians think is that it should be, if women are exercising leadership in society, that that is a sign of divine judgment, okay? Now, an appeal for this is made to, because we can ask question where is this coming from? It is often, a, is, appeal is made to Isaiah chapter three that we're going to be looking at in our study today. There, as last week, I talked about a contributing editor to John Piper's Desiring God website. It is a sister in the Lord, Abigail Dodds, uh, a graduate of seminary, of, of Bethlehem Seminary. Um, she holds this view 
And she puts forth this teaching and we talked about it last week. In a July 2nd, 2022 article on desiringgod.org, which again, John Piper's website, she, had a, she has an article called, Is Jael a Model Woman? Feminine Fight in a Feminist Age. Dodds write in the article, when God made a woman to rule over Israel as a judge, it was likely a signal of his judgment on them. The prophet Isaiah describes the judgment upon Judah this way. And she quotes Jeremiah, excuse me, uh, Isaiah chapter three and verse 12. Infants are their oppressors and women rule over them. And she goes on to say, quote, God doubles down on this theme by using another woman, Jael, to deal the fatal blow to Israel's enemy. In God's good design, men are rulers and fighters. They bear the responsibility of providing and protecting. A female judge and warrior then suggests that something has gone wrong in Israel. So she puts view, put forth the view based upon Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, and some other verses we're going to be looking at, that if you have a woman in a position of leadership over men, this means that there is a divine judgment, that something is wrong, and the women leaders are the sign of that. Another person who puts forth this view is Southern California pastor, Dr. John MacArthur. I live in Southern California. John MacArthur is the pastor of I believe it's Grace Community Church. He is the founder of the Master's Seminary. They have a school. John, John, Dr. John MacArthur also holds this view. He says in a sermon entitled, Does the Bible Permit a Woman to Teach, which you can find on YouTube, he states, quote, empowering women, empowering women makes weak men and makes everybody vulnerable to danger, end quote. This is a direct quote from his message. Let me read it again. He says in his message, quote, Empowering women, meaning putting women in positions of leadership, makes weak men. It makes men weak and makes everyone vulnerable to danger. Because if you're empowering men, he says the result of that is that men become weak. And when men become weak, then the home, the church, society becomes vulnerable, becomes dangerous. He further states in this sermon, quote, it is a divine judgment upon a nation when it's young and its women are in power. And when you overthrow the divine order, the results are always disastrous. And what's the overthrow of the divine order according to Dr. MacArthur? If women are in positions of leadership over men, that is an overthrow of the divine order. Men are to be in leadership. Again, that's why I call it the patriarchal principle or the patriarchal dogma that states that women are never, part of it is women are never to be in positions of leadership over men. And Dr. MacArthur also makes an appeal, John MacArthur makes an appeal to Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, and from verse 12 on to verse 26 to prove his point. But here's my question. Does, 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 women being, does, does a woman being in a position of leadership, even over other men, mean that something was wrong in Israel? Does women being in leadership in the church over other men, does it mean that something is wrong in the church? Does women sharing leadership with their husbands equally and they're submitting one to another? I know there are those who will say, well, the Bible doesn't say that women are that men are supposed to submit to women. We're going to get to that when I get to Ephesians chapter five. You just have to hold on and wait. A whole lot of new research has come out on this that I don't see a whole lot of people talking about um, that we will be talking about. But I'm going to put out there that if women, if men and women are submitting to one another in the home, does that mean that the home is in danger? that the home is out of order of God's divine order? Uh, does it mean that if women are in positions of leadership in society over men, that they are mayors or city council members or that they are governors or even vice president, does this mean that therefore the country is in disobedience to God? There are those, John MacArthur being one of them, who say, yes, not all complementarians hold to this view. I wanna be fair to complementarians, not all of them hold to this view, but you're more hard, what we call hard complementarians, or I believe they're also called two-point complementarians, they hold to this view. Is this true though? Is this biblical? Is Isaiah chapter three, verse 12 through 26, teaching that women in authority are a sure sign of God's judgment? And if it is not saying this, then when we read in Isaiah chapter three, verse 12, where it says, as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them, um, oh, my people, those who lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. What is this talking about? If it's not talking, if it's not saying that just because a, a, a leader is a woman, therefore the church, the home, society is in danger. Let me read you actually 
Let's read Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, and we're going to read all the way down to verse 26, because this is the passage that uh, Abigail Dodds, she, she refers to uh, chapter 12 primarily, but uh, Dr. John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur, reads chapter 12 all the way down to verse 26. So let's read it. As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you, cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. The Lord, verse 13, the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes. For you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your house. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. Now, this is where Dr. John MacArthur says that this is about women who are exercising or usurping authority or, over their husbands or dominating them. Because the, the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a jingling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. In the day, the Lord, in that day, the Lord will take away the finery, talking about their clothes, the jingling anklets, the scars and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets and the veils, the headdress, the leg ornaments and the headbands, the perfume boxes, the, the charms, and the rings, the nose jewels, the festal appeal and the mantles, the outer garments, the purses and the mirrors, the fine linen, the turbans and the robes. And so it shall be. Instead, and so it shall be that instead of a sweet smell, there will be a stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of a well said hair, baldness. This is talking about the people going into captivity. Instead of a witch robe, robe a grinding of sackcloth. Branding instead of beauty. Young men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in the war, her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall set on the ground. Now, when it says in verse 25, your young men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in the war, in his article, excuse me, in his sermon entitled, Does the Bible Permit a Woman to, to Preach? Dr. MacArthur says specifically about this passage, verse 25, that the men are falling because women have been empowered. They are in positions of authority. Therefore, the men are weak. Therefore, the men cannot stand. And therefore, the city falls. Why? Because the women are empowered and put in positions of leadership. So he sees this as happening as a result of women being in position of leadership. And I am contesting that. I'm pushing back against the pushback. So let's get into this a little bit more as we talk about what exactly is Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, and verse uh, 16 through 26, what is it actually talking about? As I stated last week, Marg Ma uh, Mosco, who is a scholar, she has a, a wonderful website, and she has a very insightful article on her website entitled, Does Isaiah 312 Show That Women Leaders Are a Bad Thing? I, I will post the article link again uh, once this message is over, we posted it last week, uh, and I was quoting from it. In this article, she points out several insightful and important facts and points about the Isaiah 312 passage. Now, let me say, I had already done some study. I found that the way that Marge had arranged this was perfectly in line with what I was thinking and the research I had done. So I'm using her format somewhat and borrowing from what she says, save me on time and having to try to figure out how to write everything. Okay, so Mark points out, and I'm a supporter of her website, friends with her on Facebook. We've talked back and forth uh, frequently on Facebook about some of these things. She points out in her article, which I do recommend you read, quote, Isaiah chapter three is an oracle of judgment. It tells of the demise of Jerusalem and Judah as a consequence of Judah's rebellion against God. And she cites Isaiah 3, 8. Uh, well, let's read Isaiah 3, 8. For Jerusalem stumble and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. So she says, quote, that this is an oracle of judgment. It tells of the demise of Jerusalem and Judah as a consequence of Judah's rebellion against God. This rebellion was brought about by the vice and mismanagement of its civil and religious leaders. At the beginning of Isaiah chapter 3, we read that God is about to remove the capable and gifted people from Judah including the ruling classes of Jerusalem, Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. This is exactly what happened in the early 6th century when the Babylonians invaded Judah and began deporting their best and their brightest. So let's read 
Isaiah chapter three, verse one through four. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from, Ju and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counsel and the skillful artisan and the expert chanter. Okay, so in verse three, we see that God is taking away, and we covered this briefly last week, he's taking away from Israel, the best and the brightest, the wisest and most skillful in their midst. He's taking them away. These are the people, these are the leaders that are needed in order for Israel to flourish. And why is God taking them away? It is judgment on uh, Israel, okay? Who is going to be left in their place? Verse four, I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. So in verse four, we say we see that God says, I'm going to give children and babes to be their princes, their rulers, their leaders. Now, of course, this is a metaphor. OK, but verse four is set in contrast to verses one through three. OK, um, in other words, the babes and the uh, and the children are set in contrast to the mighty men, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the diviner, the elder, the captains of 50, the honorable men, the counsel and the skillful artisan, and the expert enchanter. These are set in contrast, the, 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 the children and the babes are set in contrast to these people. Israel is being told that they will no longer have leaders who are wise and skillful. Now, some of these leaders also were illegitimate in terms of some of the offices here, but they are told that you will no longer have leaders who are wise and skillful, who nurtured and promoted a healthy society and culture. This will not exist among you. Rather, what they would now have are unwise, non-skillful leaders who would oppress and be a detriment to Israel. And this is signified by saying, I'm going to give you children and I'm going to give you babies to be your rulers. In other words, these are people who are not skillful. These are people who are not wise. These are, these are people who are incompetent and they can't lead you because they don't have the necessary skill and wisdom. And God says, I'm going to appoint them to be your leaders. So as Mark states in her articles, quote, these leaders in verse four are described as children and as untrained in Isaiah 3, 4. The, this idea of children as leaders come up again in our text in Isaiah 3, 12, which we just read. Furthermore, God outlines some ways people will be cheated and oppressed by their leaders in Isaiah 3, 5 uh, and in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 15, which we just read. And she says, these ideas may also be behind Isaiah 3.12. So when we look at Isaiah 3.5, let's look at 3.4 first. It says, I will give children to be their princes. Babes will rule over them. Then verse five, the people will be oppressed. Everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. The children will be insolent toward the elder and the base or the dishonorable towards the honorable. So here again, we're seeing that those who are in leadership, they, the way they're leading people, it's, it's causing them to oppress other people. They are oppressing other people. People are following the, their example. And Marg makes the statement that uh, these ideas, and we also see this in chapter 13, verse 15, which we just read about the women who have, um, uh, excuse me, we read about the elders of the people who have plundered the poor. These ideas may also be behind Isaiah chapter three, verse 12. So, Let's talk about Isaiah chapter three, verse 12. But I want to make sure you follow me here is that what God is, this is an oracle of judgment in Isaiah chapter three. God is judging the people of Israel. They are in judgment and they are in judgment uh, because of how they have been living their life, which we're going to see in just a few moments. But what about Isaiah three twelve? As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you, cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. Are, here we see, you know, women, it says, are leading Israel and children. So does this mean that a woman leading Israel is a judgment of punishment from God? Which would mean if, as Ab Abigail Dodd says, that uh, Deborah leading Israel was a sign of God's judgment, Jael killing Barak was a sign of God's judgment. And as I said last week, that's nonsensical because it says here, as for my people, children are their oppressors, women rule over them. Oh, my people, those who lead you cause you to err 
and destroy the way of your past. Now, what Abigail Dodd says and what John MacArthur says is that if women are leading, it leads to the destruction and the detriment of a, of a church or home or city or state or nation. This is their belief, okay? This is how they interpret these passages. How, and so again, Abigail Dodd says, if we see in the book of Judges that Deborah is leading Israel, that means there's a judgment, but there's a problem. It says here that those who are leading cause the people to err and destroy the, the, the way of your paths. This leadership here is detrimental. Deborah's leadership was not detrimental. As I said last week, it is nonsensical because that's like God saying to the people of Israel, it's when we read last week, God said, I will, when the people were in trouble, when they forsook the Lord, serve other gods, God would sell them into the hand of their enemies. Then the people, because of the oppression, would call out to God, which implies that they were turning back to God, repenting. Then it says God would hear their cries. He would have pity upon them, and he would raise up a judge to deliver them. Deborah is one of the judges that God raised up. She was also a prophet that God raised up on the behalf of Israel. And the Bible tells us at the end of her story in chapter five, that Israel had rest, which means that they were no longer being oppressed by their enemies. Now they were flourishing. Now they were prospering for 40 years. If, and Abigail calls, Abigail Dodds in her article, calls Deborah a leader. But we do not see Israel experiencing detriment because of her leadership, Israel experience, experiences blessings. So as I said last week, it would be like if, if my godson, my grandson was getting in trouble at school and I said, hey, I heard that you've been skipping school. And, I, and your dad told me that you have been um, not doing your homework and talking back to your teacher. He goes, yeah, I've been doing that. Okay, I tell you what, this is what your punishment is going to be. I'm taking you to Disneyland. I'm going to take you to the uh, to to Disneyland. Thirty minutes from my house, I'm going to take you to Disneyland. I'm going to buy you all the candy and popcorn that you want. And after that, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy you a new bike. That's your punishment. That'll teach you to talk back to your teacher. You will look at that and go like, "What kind of punishment is that? It's not a punishment. That's not a judgment." In the same way, when God raises up deliverers, judges to deliver Israel. In no way, form, or fashion can you interpret that to say, well, yeah, but that was a judgment on Israel. Judgment always results in negative consequences. Deborah being raised up as a leader, Jael killing Sisera did not result in negative consequences for Israel. It resulted in the land having rest. They were able to flourish and prosper, safety from their enemies for 40 years. So it is nonsensical, in my opinion, based upon the text, to argue that Deborah being a leader was a sign of God's judgment because God's judgment always results in negative consequences. And they had negative consequences. What was it? They were sold in to the hands of their enemy. That was the negative consequences of their, of their lack of faithfulness to the Lord. And then when they turned to the Lord and repented, God in his mercy and grace raised up deliverers, in this case, Judges 4 and 5, Deborah, and also using Jael, to bring freedom and deliverance. And of course, Barak was a part of that, to bring them freedom and deliverance. It was not a judgment. It was the grace of God manifest, okay? So this doesn't fit. Isaiah, you cannot use Isaiah chapter three, verse 12 to say, see, if there's a woman leader, it is detrimental because we don't see that. We don't see that with Miriam, who was a prophet and a leader. We don't see that with Jael, I mean, excuse me, with Deborah. We do not see negative consequences. Okay, so let me go on. We talked about this last week. How are then, how can we understand Isaiah chapter 3 verse 12? I promise we're going to talk about this. In her article, Mark states that this passage about, about women in 312 can be understood in at least three ways. Number one, literally. Number two, metaphorically. And number three, as a different reading other than women in Hebrew. In other words, the word women in Hebrew can actually be read differently than the way it's translated here. Those are three ways. Uh, literally, metaphorically, and reading the word woman differently in the Hebrew. Now, we talked about metaphorically last week. We looked at the fact that this could actually be used as an insult for male leaders. We see this in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 6. Uh, and I'll just look at it real quick here. If you want to turn over there, Isaiah chapter 19. I talked about this last week. So if you want to get the full message, go and watch last week's message, number 19, message 19. I talk about this. Uh, go to 
Isaiah chapter 19. And we're going to look at verse, uh, what is it? Verse 6. 19 verse 6. God is speaking. It says, um, oh, wait a minute. Did I get that right? No, verse 16. I'm sorry. Isaiah chapter 19 verse 16 is what it should say. My notes are wrong here. Okay. In verse 16, um, it says, in that day, Egypt will be like women and will be afraid and fear because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts when he, which he waves over it. So here we see that it is used, meta, oh, the woman is used metaphorically uh, where Egypt is concerned. It is used as a put down as an insult. Now, I won't get into it because it'll take too much time. Go watch last week's message. I talk about how this is not necessarily an insult against women per se, but it is saying that if the Egypt, their men will be like women. To call a man like a woman in the ancient world was a way of dishonoring him, disgracing him, putting him down, okay? Does this mean therefore that women were seen as less than by God? No, it does not. The, the two do not necessarily equate. You say, well, Michael, how do you say that? I said it last week. I said, like when I was growing up, one of the things that could be used to insult you, because I, I grew up in the black community, if somebody said to you, you sound, talking about the way you talk, you sound white. If you were a black kid growing up and you were told you sound white, that was an insult because it was implying you were sounding like or trying to sound like something you were not. Does it mean that it was wrong for white people to talk that way? No, it did not. It was okay for white people to talk that way because the, the idea was that's the way white people talk. That's the, not the way black people talk. At least that was the belief of some people. So to say to a black person, you sound white, was an insult to a black person, not necessarily an insult to the person who was white. It was not meant as a slight against white people, it, but the metaphor was used to slight a black person. In the same way to say to an Egyptian male, you will be like a woman is a slight to the Egyptian male, but not necessarily God putting down females. Is that clear? Okay, just wanna cover that. So one of the ways it could be used is metaphorically. I covered it last week, go back and watch it again. The second way it could be used is literally. Literally, some believe, uh, and this is from um, Mark's uh, article, quote, some believe that the mean of Isaiah 312, as it is in the Hebrew text, should be taken literally, despite the rhetorical nature of the prophecy. And this, by rhetorical nature, this prophecy is seeking to persuade. That's what rhetoric is about in the ancient world. It is to persuade, and it's trying to move the people to do something here. She says, so there are some who take it literally, despite the rhetorical nature of the prophecy. If, and we know it's rhetorical when it says things like, uh, I'm going to give you babes and children to be your leaders, okay? Um, let me read it again. So some believe that the meaning of Isaiah 312, as it is in the Hebrew text, should be taken literally despite, despite the rhetorical nature of the prophecy. If so, Judah is being ruled, if it's taken literally, by inexperienced youth, okay? The Hebrew word used in the verse for uh, youth or, or, yeah, for, for let me go back to, I, to verse uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors. The word for children there is the Hebrew word olel. This is from Mark's article again. More commonly, ref, it more commonly refers to small children, even infants. Nevertheless, God may be speaking about Ahaz, who was a weak and wicked king. In the year 72... 732 BC, Ahaz began his 16-year rule at the age of 20. 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 2. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 16 says, Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. These are inexperienced people who don't know anything about leadership, is what Ecclesiastes 3, Ecclesiastes 10, 16 is saying. So Mark is saying that it, this could be referring literally to like a king, King Ahaz, who was 20 year old when he began his 16 year rule. He would have been seen as a child. According to this literal interpretation, Judah is also ruled by women, perhaps the queen mother, Queen Ataliah in 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 through 16, and other prominent women in the royal court. Queen Ataliah was a wicked queen of Israel. She killed all of the heirs. So it could be that what Mark is saying, if we take this literally, as some people take it literally, it is referring to Queen Ataliah, who was a wicked queen. And she says other prominent women in the royal court. 
These may be the haughty women of Zion denounced in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16 through 25. And we read that. These are the women, the daughters of Zion, who are walking haughtily, walking with outstretched necks. All of the commentaries that I read basically say, yeah, these are referring to women who are well-to-do. So these may, may be, maybe royal women of the court who are haughty. Mark goes on to say that the descriptions of these haughty women show that they are wealthy and therefore influential. Okay, so these might be the people that if you're taking this literally, I'm saying if, these are the people that it could be referring to. Okay, so we said metaphorical, literal. The final way is that you can read, there's a different reading, reading other than woman in Hebrew or women in Hebrew. Let me quote from Marg's work again. Quote, a third possible interpretation, which is favored by some scholars and biblical translators, is that the word for women in Isaiah 12, you know, Isaiah 312, was not originally a part of Isaiah 312. Rather, the original word meant creditors. There is also some doubt about the word children in, uh, in uh, Isaiah 312. The, and this is again from Mark's article. The Hebrew word for women in Isaiah 312, the word for women is nashim, nashim, which is the letters nun, sheen, yod, and mim. Okay? This is, uh, now, this is, uh, this word nashim has the same consonants in Hebrew as another Hebrew word, noshim. Okay? Now, we're spelling this out. The consonants are in Hebrew. Nun, shem, yod, shem. Or if we were to translate, transliterate it into English, it would be N, S, H, uh, a, a yod, we say an I, and then a mem is an M. That would be the consonants, okay? Because Hebrew, uh, 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 biblical Hebrew actually doesn't have any vowels, it's all consonants. So it would be N, if we're transliterate, transliterating, transliterating? Yeah, we're, if, we, if we do a transliteration, from the Hebrew into the Greek, the noon is the N, the sheen is S-H, the yod would be I, and the mem would be M. Those are the consonants. Well, there's another Hebrew word, no sheen, has the exact same consonants. Noon, sheen, ein, mem. N, S-H, I, M. This word means creditors. So in other words, when you're reading this in the Hebrew, and I'm looking at it in the Hebrew right here, it looks pre the, the words look the same. They look exactly the same. Context helps you to determine how it should be translated, okay? But nashim means women. No shim, no shim means predators. And it says the Aramaic, there is an Aramaic targum, which is an Aramaic interpretation of the Hebrew text. The Aramaic Targum of Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, has no seem or no sheem creditors. So one of the ways that early Jewish interpreters interpreted this text, which is what an Aramaic Targum is, they said that it is not that women will be your oppressors, but creditors. Uh, and also the NET translation, the Net Bible, and I wouldn't look this up, and this again is quoting from Mark, but I wouldn't check it. It translates the pertinent phrase as creditors rule over them. So even the net translation sees this as creditors, as a possible, a possible rendering of this text, that it shouldn't be read as women, but it's talking about creditors. Verse 13 and 15 also alludes to this as Mark points out. Let's read verses 13 through 15. So it talks about creditors ruling over and oppressing the people. Verse 13, the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes. For you have eaten up the vineyard, the plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord of hosts. So we see that if, that if it is talking about creditors, if it's talking about creditors oppressing the people, not women, but creditors oppressing the people, then what it is saying, verse 13 to 15, gives some context. So we see here that the poor is being oppressed by the rich who would have been the creditors. When we did our series on flourishing, we talked about this in detail, how in the first century, how, the, how some uh, people who were Jewish, who were not walking according to Torah, and how Greco-Roman uh, landowners, how they amassed their wealth because they would lend to those who were poor, and when they couldn't pay back, they would take their land. 
they would oppress the poor. There was much of that going on. One of the major complaints and words of the prophets against the people of Israel is how they treat the poor. So it could be, it is plausible, it is plausible that this text here, 312, is not talking about children and women, it's talking about creditors who are oppressing the people, and then verses 13 through 15 talks about what they are doing. It is plausible. Okay. We also have to keep in mind that Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7 says this, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. The rich rule over the poor. Proverbs 22, 7. The word for rule here in Hebrew in Proverbs uh, 22, 7 is the same word for rule in Isaiah 3, 12, mashal. Mashal again says, verse, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, as for my people, Children are their, are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Same Hebrew word, the mashal. If it's creditors, this is what it's talking about here in Proverbs 22. The rich rule over the poor. The borrower is servant to the lender. It's talking about the rich lending to the poor. When you lend to the poor, if you can't pay it back, you end up being enslaved to the lender. This is not necessarily a positive proverb here. It could be a negative one. And it's talking about the oppression of the poor, the wicked rich against the poor. The oppression of the poor by the wicked. And I use that word on purpose, the wicked rich. Not all rich were wicked, but there were wicked rich. Most of the things you see in the book of Proverbs and in the Bible against the rich, the words against the rich are not against the rich because they're rich. They are, they are against the rich because of how the rich acquired their riches. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, we talked about that in our series on flourishing. Okay, so Mark goes on to say, quote, the idea of being ex ex extorted by creditors fits with the overall context of Isaiah chapter three. And I agree with this. But so also does the idea of inept, ineffectual people as leaders. I agree with this too. It, and I'm, I am of the persuasion that it was probably both. Meaning you got people who are exhorting those who are poor, they're taking advantage of them, they are oppressing them, and they are also inept, ineffectual, unskilled, incompetent leaders, okay? Mark goes on and she says this, whatever the original word may have been, nashim, women, or noshim, creditors, God was saying Judah was being misled by incompetent and unscrupulous people. That's the message that Isaiah is getting out, and I agree with Mark on this. This is the point of Isaiah 3.12, that Israel was being led and oppressed by people who were unscrupulous, unethical, unwise, and incompetent. This is what was causing problems for Israel. Isaiah 3.12 says that. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 13 through uh, 16 also says that. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 9. In listening to Dr. MacArthur and reading the article by Abigail Dodds, they did not bring this up. This passage, as I was reading it for more context, I looked at it and went, well, wait a minute. What about what it says here? So Isaiah chapter nine, look at verse 13. For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elder and the honorable, he is the head. Notice the elder and the honorable is the head, the leader. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people, who are the leaders that is talking about here? The elder, the honorable, possibly the prophet. The leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. It is the leaders who are the problem. And notice here that it is implied that these leaders are also men. Now, could, could women be involved? Yes, women could be involved, but Israel is not in trouble because women are appointed to leadership. Israel is in trouble because Israel has departed from God. Their leaders have departed from the way of the Lord. They've departed from the Torah. They've departed from the ways of God. John MacArthur, oh, let, uh, before I move on, let me say this. What Mark says here uh, about the, the different ways of looking at this, this is also confirmed. So I did some a little bit more research. This is the, the Expositor's Bible Commentary. This is volume six on Proverbs to Isaiah. Tremper Longman III and David Garland are the um, editors. And in the commentary on Isaiah, 
this is what is said by the author. Um, I forget the author's name. Let me check for a moment. Let me get it for you. The author is, because I just like to, you know, be a little bit more thorough. Ooh, a lot of, uh, <laughs> okay, should have set this up ahead of time. The author is Gregory F. Grogan. Oh, no, excuse me, not Gregory, Jeffrey W. Grogan. Jeffrey Grogan. He is the one who wrote this. So Professor Gro uh, Grogan wrote this, or Grogan wrote this. He says in a footnote about the three possible ways of interpreting Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. He says, uh, Clements, who's another scholar, among others, follows, follows the Septuagint and the Targum in re rendering users instead of women here. In other words, the Septuagint, I forgot to say this, the Septuagint, and Mark talks about this in her, argue, in her article, when the Septuagint was translated from Hebrew into Greek, and the Septuagint is what we call the Greek version of the Bible, the authors of the Septuagint they translated that word not as nashim, women, they translated as noshim, as users or creditors. So the Greek translation of the Old Testament sees this as referring to creditors, okay? And Clements, among others, they follow the Targums and the Targum and the Septuagint in rendering users, uh, usurers, those who charge credit or creditors instead of women. Another scholar, Mockline, However, thinks the concept of extractors uh, ruling is unlikely and accepts the Hebrew as authentic. He think it should re it is referring to women. He thinks that the idea of exactors rulings would be unlikely. However, Proverbs twenty two seven says the borrower is servant to the lender. the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. That would be my pushback on that. Uh, he and he also though he says the rule of the queen mother had been experienced in. Judah, and this is talking about Queen Athaliah, and was not well esteemed. So that's his view, that this is probably talking about the woman who ruled uh, uh, the, the queen, and also probably some of these women here that it's speaking of in chapter 13 through 15. Then he quotes one more scholar, Wilderberger, after discussing various possibilities, concludes that an assured solution is not possible. In other words, scholars have looked at this and said, you know what? There's just too many possibilities. And Mark lists these possibilities. It can be literal, it can be metaphorical, or you could read it, you could read woman as not nashim, woman, but as noshim, as creditors. And here are some other scholars who are saying, yes, it, it, there are different ways of being able to read this. And one scholar says, you can't say with absolute certainty how this is supposed to be um, uh, interpreted, how it should be translated, I should say. Now, again, the Septuagint Bible, the Targums translated as Nushim. So there were those who did read it as creditors, not as women, okay? Just so I wanted you to be aware of all of this. So um, there are different ways to be able to read it. If you were to ask me, say, Mike, what do you think it is? I think it's talking about, now this is, this is Michael's, this is Mike's version of, this is Mike's view of this. I think it is more of a metaphorical with the idea that women should be translated as the creditors, that it should not be uh, nashim women, but noshim creditors. And that, uh, that the idea here is that these are people who are, who are taking advantage of the poor, okay? Now, even if you said, well, I think it, Mike, it should be literal, it should be women. Okay, but still, these are women who are acting wickedly. Okay, and they are again taking advantage of the poor. They're taking advantage of different people, not because they are women, but because they have departed away from the way they have departed from the way of the Lord. Now, John MacArthur, in his teaching, states that Isaiah chapter three, verse twelve, and chapter six and verses sixteen through twenty-six, chapter. Let me say it again. John MacArthur in his teaching states that Isaiah chapter three, verse 12 and verses 16 through 26 is about women stepping out of their God ordained bound, stepping out of the God ordained boundaries of their husband's control. Let me read that again. John MacArthur teaches that these passages, Isaiah chapter three, verse 12 and Isaiah chapter three, verse 16 through 26 is about women stepping out of their God ordained stepping out of the God-ordained boundaries of their husband's control 
He actually says this. I'm, so I'm quoting directly what he says. And putting themselves on display with seduction in mind. So John MacArthur sees this passage as speaking directly about and literally about verse, verse 12 as of literally about women, that they're stepping out from under the authority of their husbands and that they are seeking to be seductive. Now, the seductive part, I agree with. If it's talking literally about women, the passage here and practically all of the scholars that I read said the same thing that what's being said here is the idea that these women are presenting themselves seductively. That I don't have a difficulty with. That I would agree with him on. However, he sees what is happening in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, and in chapter 16 through verse 26, as, quote, living out, a living out of the curse of Genesis 3.16. This is literally what he says in his message, that what we see in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, and then verse 16 through 26, which are the passages in his sermon that he refers to, he says that this is a living out of the curse. As a matter of fact, John MacArthur had been talking about Deborah. He had made the statement that there are there were no spirit, women who were spiritual leaders. There were no women who were prophets or as he would also, he said that literally, but he also said no women would sustain prophetic ministries like Elijah and Elisha in Israel. That's just not true, but that's what he said. And then he says um, that, you know, that Genesis chapter three, he holds to the view that Genesis chapter three teaches that when it says your desire shall be for your husband, we talked about this, and you shall and he shall rule over you that that desire is an innate desire to, for, uh, in women to dominate and control their husbands. This is the teaching of Dr. John MacArthur. And this is the teaching of a lot of complementarians. Now, let me say some egalitarians also hold to the view that this desire is a desire to control. But they also teach egalitarians is that men ruling over the women, that that's also a desire to control. So egalitarians will say, both of those are, are bad desires, okay? So what, what some egalitarians teach is that, okay, this is bad desire. And what this sets up, sets up is the conflict between men and women, that there is a desire to dominate each other. Some egalitarians hold to this. I don't. If you go back to the lessons that I did on chapter three, verse 16, I lay out the reasons why I don't think that is so based upon the scholarship based upon what scholars have also looked at in terms of the Hebrew and its comparison to Genesis chapter four, verse seven, which is also often used to say, this is why the verse means the desire here is dominate. We looked at that, why that may very well not be the case, okay? So, but John MacArthur believes it is the case. He believes that the desire of women that is spoken of in Genesis chapter three, verse 16, speaks of the woman's desire to rule over her husband. However, he believes that the verse that says he shall rule over you is a positive thing, not a negative thing. So it's the woman who has the problem. It's the woman who has this innate, secret, cursed desire as a result of the fall that is inside of her. And if she gets out from under the authority and submission to her husband, which is how it's kept in check, as the woman is stays under submission to her husband and, and, and follows his lead, that desire remains in check. And if the husband is ruling and leading like he is supposed to over the wife, that desire is kept in check. But if she gets out from under that authority and the husband doesn't do anything, then the woman takes upon authority. She's going to rule over her husband. It weakens the husband or weakens other men. And it causes disaster for the nation. He literally says it is disastrous if you overthrow the created divine order. Okay. So what he sees in Isaiah chapter three, verse 12, and Isaiah chapter three, verse 16 through 26 is a living out of the Genesis 3, 16 curse that women are giving into, that what we see here in, in Isaiah chapter three is women giving into their sinful, innate, cursed desire to dominate and rule over men. This is how he sees it. And I would say that this is a misreading of Isaiah chapter three. Why? Let's read Isaiah chapter three. Now we've already covered Isaiah chapter three, verse 12. And there are three possible readings. I think I lean more towards is either metaphorical or it's speaking of credit, creditors or in some way both, okay? I do not think that it is saying that women are ruling over you and that because it is women, therefore 
these women, uh, th therefore this is a curse, that women ruling is a curse. The idea here is that you've got people ruling over you who are incompetent to rule over you and in or who don't have what it takes to rule over you, okay? That's the idea here. And again, women can be used as a metaphor. Keep that in mind, all right? What about chapter three and verse 16 through 26? Let me take a sip of water. For those of you watching, am I making sense for those of you in the Zoom room? Am I making sense? Let's look at Isaiah chapter three. Let's look at verse 16. Moreover, the Lord says, now keep in mind that Dr. John MacArthur is saying that this verse deals with women coming out from under the authority of their husbands and therefore dominating their husbands and making their husbands weak. He says, I mean, verse 16 says, moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a jingling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery, the jingling anklets, the scars, and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, and the veils, the headdress, the leg ornaments, and the headbands, the perfume boxes, the charms, and the rings, the nose jewels, the festive apparel, and the mantles, the outer garments, the purses, and the mirrors, the fine linen, the turbans, and the robes, and so, and then the robes, and then he goes, then at verse 24 it says, and so it shall be, Instead of a sweet smell, there will be a stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. He's talking about the women. Instead of rich robe, a girding of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword. You're mighty in the war. Because it says your men shall fall by the sword and you're mighty in the war, Dr. MacArthur says, see, you see what happens when women are in charge? It makes men, when women are empowered, he literally says this, it makes the men weak and it makes the city vulnerable. So the men are falling, according to Dr. MacArthur, because the women are in charge. So the fall of the men, the weakness of the men, the fall of the city is due to the women being in charge. And again, I say, this is wrong. In, first of all, in context, Isaiah chapter three, verse 12, and chapter 16 through the verse 26, as I said before, as well, as the entire oracle of judgment against Israel. And this is an oracle of judgment against Israel. This is not a living out of, Deut of, of Genesis chapter three, verse 16. This is not women seeking, because Dr. MacArthur says that he says, you know, women wanted to be in charge. The rebellion was set in motion. And then he says in the sermon, women unfortunately did get their place in the sun. And he turns to Isaiah chapter three to show how the rebellion finally did happen. This is not, what this passage is talking about. This is not a living out of Genesis chapter three and verse 16. If anything, it is a living out of Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 10 through 15, and Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse six through 18. I'm gonna show you that in just a moment. What I want you to do first though, let's read some context. Turn to Isaiah chapter two. Isaiah chapter two, let's look at verse five. Isaiah chapter two, verse five. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with Eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is also, now notice God is talking about Israel. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands that which their own fingers have made. People bow down and each man humbles himself. Therefore, do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. Now notice, hear this. The lofty looks of man shall be humble. The holiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Now notice it talks about the lofty looks of man and the holiness of men being bowed down, their pride. Verse 12, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low, upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the beautiful sloops. The loftiness 
for the pride of man shall be bowed down. The haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. Now, he says here that God is going to bring down the haughty and the prideful. Notice also he says their land is filled with riches, it's filled with chariots, it's filled with gold, it's filled with horses, but they've become prideful. Why is that important? Hang on. Let's go back. And what did God say he's going to do with the pride, with the proud? He's going to bring them down, right? Notice what it says here. Again, go back to chapter 3, verse 16. The daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes. This is pride, walking and mincing as they go, making a jingling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will strike with a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. The Lord will uncover their secret parts. This is all about disgracing them. This is about dishonoring them, bringing them into a place of dishonor. They have been walking and they've been worshiping other idols. They've been walking in haughtiness and pride. They may have been involved in um, uh, uh, oppressing the poor. And God is saying, I'm your place of pride, your place of haughtiness, I'm going to bring you down, which is what he said in chapter two. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery, the jingling anchor, the scars, and all the rest, all the fine stuff, all of the stuff that makes them look good and causes them to be proud, God says, I'm taking it all away because of what, because of how you have walked. And he says, instead of a sweet smell, there's going to be a stench. This is verse 24. Instead of a sash, you're going to have a rope wrapped around you, taking you into bondage. Instead of well-set hair, you will be bald. A woman's hair, and especially in the ancient world, was her glory. To be bald was to be shamed. Instead of rich robe, a girding of sackcloth. Branding instead of beauty. And then he says, your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in the war. But it is not because the women are in positions of authority. If anything, they're in positions of pride. And God says, I'm going to bring all the haughty down. Now, as I said, this is not a living out. Because Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, says nothing about pride and haughtiness. It says nothing about that. This is a living out of, Genesis, of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 through 15. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 16 through 18. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at verse 10. Deuteronomy 6.10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities of which you did not build, houses full of all good things which, you're, which you did not fill, you not wells, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods. When is God telling them to not go after other gods? When you come into the land and you are full and you've been blessed, he says, don't forget me. Meaning, not that all of a sudden they have amnesia like, oh man, I forgot about God. It's not that. It's the idea of you reject my ways. You, you, you no longer submit to me. And he says, you go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And let's look at verse 6. Deuteronomy 8 verse Six, therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of waters, of fountains and springs and flow that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you, shall, you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hill you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied. Remember it said that the land was filled with silver and gold? And all that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the, bondage, from the house of bondage, who led you to the great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flimsy, flinty rock, 
who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do, to do you good in the end, that you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God. It is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if, by, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so shall you perish because you will not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. Why was Israel in trouble? It is exactly what we read in Isaiah chapter three, or excuse me, Isaiah chapter two. They were filled, they were full, but they got into pride and they started to serve other gods, which means they stopped obeying the Torah. They stopped following the ways of God and they began to follow in the ways of the nations. They began to do that which was contrary to the will of God. They began to oppress the poor. What is interesting here is when we read what the prophet is saying is going to happen to the women in chapter three, verse 16, and through all the way to verse 26, not at one time does he rebuke them for exercising dominion over their husbands or over other men. Not one time do we see in all of this, God saying, and you women, here's the other thing you're doing wrong. Not only are you worshiping other idols, not only are you oppressing the poor, but you're dominating your men. And men, you're letting them do that. That is not a rebuke that comes from the prophet. That has to be read into the text. The text does not say it. And why do the mighty men fall in verse 20? Five, when it says your mighty, your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in the war because the Lord is not among them. You go back, you read Deuteronomy. When God is not among them, they cannot stand. It is not because women are in charge and when women are empowered, therefore men become weak. That is not the teaching of scripture. The teaching of scripture is when Israel falls, when they are not able to stand against the enemy, it's because they have departed away from the ways of God. Somebody might say, well, Mike, Women ruling over men, That's the, they're not submitting to the men. That's departing from the way of God. I defy you, and I mean that in the most godly way possible, show me one commandment in the Torah where women are explicitly instructed to submit to the authority of their husband with a penalty. We have children, honor your mother and father. But where in all of the Torah are wives in the Torah, in the Tanakh? And where in all of the Torah and the Tanakh and in the prophets, well, Torah and Tanakh, the, the, well, in, in, in the Tanakh is the Torah, the Neve, Emek, Ketuvim. Where in all of the prophets do you ever see the prophets rebuking the women for not being in submission to the men? And the men being rebuked for not being in rule over the women. And where in all of the Torah is there one commandment in the Torah, in the Torah, in the Torah, where it says, men, you must rule over your husband. I might say, well, Mike, Genesis chapter three. Uh-uh. Genesis chapter three says, God to the woman, he shall rule over you. There is never a commandment explicitly given to the man to rule over the woman. God states what shall be. He does not say this is what will, what, this is what must be as an imperative. He just states what will be. He doesn't tell, turn to the man and says, by the way, Adam, you're to rule. It's not there. There is no commandment within the Torah. And you do not see the prophets rebuking. You do not see Isaiah rebuking the women for dominating the men or the women empowering themselves to rule over the men. It's actually the exact opposite. It's actually the exact opposite. We look at Isaiah chapter 25 again. Your men shall fall by the sword and you're a mighty in the war. If you look in the Torah, this always happens because Israel departs from the Lord. They serve other gods. God is not in their midst. And when that happens, they, do, they are not able to fight against their enemies. Or as the book of Judges says in chapter two, when Israel departed from the Lord and they served other gods, God sold them into the hand of their enemies. They, they, there was no way they could fight because God was not on their side. God told Israel, if you don't serve me, if you serve me, I will be an enemy to your enemies. But if you don't serve me, I will be an enemy to you, okay? It was the cost of a lack of faithfulness and loyalty to God. It is never said in the scripture, if your women rule, if women are empowered, the men grow weak and the nation is in trouble. That is importing something into the text that the text itself never says. Isaiah chapter three, verse 16 through 20, 
25 or through 20, or we'll start at 24, never says anything about the relationship between the husbands and the wives. Never. It, ne it says nothing about women coming out from under the authority of the husbands. It says nothing about the women dominating the husbands. Now, it does talk about the women being seductive. But again, all of Israel is in disobedience to God. All of Israel, the men and the women and the leaders, everybody is in disobedience and they're doing things their own way. They're not walking in the Torah. Okay, here's the other thing. So verse 26 says, your men shall fall by the sword, your mighty in the war. Her gates shall lament and, the, and mourn. She shall be desolate that sit on the ground. She, shall, she being desolate, she'll sit on the ground. This is the city of Jerusalem. It's going to be desolate. Again, John MacArthur says this is because the women are in charge. No, I said it's because based upon the teachings of the Tanakh, based upon the prophets, based upon what Moses said in Deuteronomy, when Israel departs away from the Torah, they are unfaithful to God and they worship other gods, then Israel falls not because women are in leadership. If that was true, then Deborah being in leadership should have call, caused a further downfall of Israel. But Israel ended up having rest because Deborah was not a wicked leader. Deborah was a godly leader. Do you realize out of really almost all of the leaders in the book of Judges, Deborah is the one with, with, with a spotless record? Most of, if not all, of the other leaders, the, all the other judges, have something wrong. Even Samuel, not that he did anything personally wrong, but his sons were a mess. Deborah's the only one who has a spotless record. Okay, anyway, look at chapter four now, and this is where we're going to close. Chapter four, verse one. In that day, seven women, and I talk about this day of judgment, in the day when men fall by the sword and your mighty men in the war, in that day, seven, when they have been disgraced, seven women shall take hold of one man saying, we will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Does this sound like women trying to dominate men? No, they're not trying to dominate the men. The women are not here seeking to dominate. Rather, they're seeking to be joined to a man to take away their reproach and shame. And here's the thing. These women have their own economic provision. Listen to what it says. We will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. In other words, we're not looking to you to provide for us. We just want to be called by your name. This is to take away the reproach that they will have experienced in the verses above. These women have their own economic provision. They have their own economic resources. The economic power of the men have been depleted. How do we know this? Look at Isaiah chapter three, look at verse six. Isaiah chapter three, verse six. This is talking about the judgment. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father saying, you have clothing, you be our ruler. Now these are, these are men talking to other men. You have clothing, you be our ruler and let these ruins be under your power. And that day he will protest saying, I cannot cure your ears. For in my house is neither food nor clothing do not make me a ruler of the people. He says, I don't have the provision to take care of you. So when we get over to chapter four, you've got women coming to what seven women coming to one man. Why is it seven women coming to one man? Because God is saying, most of your men are going to be killed. Most of your men are going to be killed. And so these women are saying, you don't even have to give the bride price. We don't, you don't have to pay. We'll forego the, the, the normal cultural standards where things have to be provided and a dowry have to be made. We're going to go, go bypass all that. We will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Technically speaking, the women are in the position of economic power and leverage. They have their own food. The men do not. But the women are saying, we want to be called by your name. They're not seeking to dominate. They're seeking to associate with a man to have his name to take away the reproach. Let me read to you again from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. This is on this passage, chapter four, verse one. It says, just as swiftly we return to Jerusalem's women in chapter four, verse one. Perhaps those pictured here have been widowed, chapter three, verse 25. Remember the men in war, they've fallen through the violent overthrow of the city. In any case, the judgment on the city has drastically altered the normal male-female proportions in the population. These concerned women are prepared to forego the normal prerequisites of marriage to secure its status. These women are prepared to forego the normal prerequisites of marriage to secure its status, or at least to gain the protection of a name. 
If we find this difficult to understand, it is largely because we live in a society that does not place as high a premium on marriage and childbearing. So these women were looking for the reproach that would come upon them to be taken away. And this is by joining themselves to another man, because this is the way the patriarchal culture of that time functioned. If we join ourselves to this man, we will have his name and our reproach will be taken away. Let me give you some more insight from this book, the Bible background commentary, the Old Testament. Uh, and that reference was Isaiah chapter four, verse one that I just read, Isaiah four, one. Now I'm gonna to read to you from the Bible background commentary, Old Testament. This is by John Walton, Victor H. Matthews, and Mark Cavallis. This is their commentary on Isaiah chapter four, verse one. They say, um, offer of the seven women. It is to be presumed that these women have lost their husbands and son and are therefore left socially, socially defenseless, even though they are not without means. Economically, they have means. This was a common aftermath of war. It was contractually and legally the husband's responsibility to provide food and clothing. These women are not looking for financial provision and would certainly be willing to bypass the usual conventions of a bride price. Their need for familial association may simply stem from social ma mandates or in the worst cases may reflect the desire for a household for children that have been conceived through rape by enemy soldiers. You know, that did take place. The ancient world was bad, it was mean. So it could have been, number one, these women, their husbands have been killed, they have been raped, they've conceived children, that would bring a stigma. They don't have a husband, socially, they would be disgraced. So they're seeking a man to associate with him and his family to take on their name, give a name to their children, so they will not be social out outcasts. So they will no longer be disgraced. They would come back to a place of honor again. But my point here is these women are not seeking to dominate over. It goes contrary to everything that has been said by Abigail Dodson and John MacArthur. These women are not seeking to dominate. They're actually seeking protection, socially speaking. They're seeking protection so that they will not be women seen as disgraceful. It could be, could be, we don't know for certain, but it could be that some of them were raped. And as a result, that as their husbands were killed, as a result, they have children now and they have no one to care for these children. These children, quote, don't have a name. So they seek for a man who they can attach themselves to so that the disgrace and the reproach will be taken away. And keep in mind, the men at this time do not have economic power, but the women do, but they're not seeking to exercise and dominate in that way. They were very possibly doing that before in verses, uh, in verses 15 through 20, in verses 15 through, um, well, verses 13 down to um, uh, 16 that these women were haughty, they were displaying their riches. Um, some people have suggested that, the, that they got, that their riches came from their husbands who were oppressing the poor. Very possible, very plausible, that the reason they were rich was because they had gotten this money from the oppression of the poor that was enacted by them and their husbands, because that seems to be the context. So my point in saying all of this is that the passage ends with women seeking out, uh, and it's the judgment of the Lord. They're not dominating the men, even though they are in the economic position to do so. Money talks. They, they are, they, they've got the provision, they've got the land, they've got the food. We read in verse six, where the men are saying, I don't have anything. The women saying, you don't even gotta feed us. We, are, we have our own food, we have our own provision. We just wanna be called by our name. That is not seeking to dominate that is seeking protection of a name so that reproach will be taken away. Because this is an ancient Near Eastern culture where honor and shame is highly important. Does that make sense? So I do not agree with Abigail Dotson. I do not agree with Dr. John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur, that women in positions of leadership, you cannot use Isaiah chapter three, verse 12 to argue that women in positions of leadership over men means that the land is in, under divine judgment and that empowering women causes weak men. 
These men were in a position of weakness because the nation as a whole turned away from God. That's why they were in the position of weakness. Were there women who, who were in position of authority? Possibly. We know Ataliah was a king, possibly. We know that there were rich women, rich women who may have been uh, uh, oppressing the poor. So it is possible, but there's other ways of being able to read the text. But my point here is that the land was not under judgment because, and the, women, and the men were weak and falling because women were in positions of leadership. It, they, it wasn't because, hey, you've got these leaders and their, judge, and their gender brings God's judgment. That is not the case. You have to read that into the text. You cannot read that from the text. All right, so I hope this was beneficial for you. I hope you learned from it. You may need to go to listen to this again and, and watch it a few times because I shared a lot of information. And I hope this again was a blessing to you. If it was, and if you learned from it, you think other people might be able to benefit, please direct them to our web, our YouTube channel, KIC. TV, KIC TV, keeping it in context TV. Uh, and uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe. That helps the algorithms I'm told to go up and it helps to spread our message. What we wanna do is help people to understand the Bible in its original historical, cultural, linguistic, literary context. If we better understand what God was saying as we look at it through these contexts, then we can better understand what God is saying to us today, all right? God bless you. Thank you so much, Lord willing. We'll see you next week. And next week, we're going to be getting some more into the Deborah dilemma. We're going to talk a little bit more about, was Deborah raised up because there was no man? And was Barak a coward? Next week, Lord willing. God bless. See you guys later. Bye-bye.